Hello, everybody. Welcome to this first uh, Evil Tree seminar in, 2000, in 2021. We are very proud to have Ari Hoffman today with us. Before we start, uh, I want to say a few very little technical things. Um, first of all, I want to, want to make a little announcement that we will have the, I hope you can see it, the first uh, Apple Tree conference uh, organized this year uh, in Switzerland from 14th to 17th to September. We will start the registration most likely next week. So if you like to register and send an abstract, please feel free to do so. I have a few technical announcements that I want to say. Uh, first of all, uh, please mute yourself during the talk, also during the questions if you're not asking something, but you can leave your camera on. I think it would be nice if you do that, then we have kind of a seminar feeling. I have to announce that you, this, uh, you are, this talk is broadcasted, is recorded and broadcasted now live on YouTube. So if you don't want to be on YouTube, if you don't want to be recorded, you have to leave the meeting actually now. Um, we will have three more the seminar talks uh, after the talk of Ori Hoffman. I will start to uh, say something about this later. But for now, I want to pass on to Felix Kugerli, who is the mod mo moderator today, and uh, uh, who, who will introduce Evil Tree and Ori Hoffman. Felix, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christian, for this introduction. And maybe you can stop sharing the screen so that I can see my notes. <laughs> So I'm very pleased uh, to initiate this second series of seminars. Uh, uh, we had a last series in fall last year, which was quite well received. So uh, I'm glad to see that there's a second round now. Uh, my name is Felix Gugerle, as Christian indicated. I work at the Swiss Federal Research Institute, WSL, the one institution that will host this fall's uh, Evil Tree Conference that Christian already indicated. So what is Evil Tree for those who are not familiar with this um, name, term, uh, network? So originally, uh, Evil Tree uh, functioned as a network of excellence with support of the European Commission. And uh, this network ran uh, from 2006 to 2010 with the financial support of the U European Commission. As a kind of an obligation, uh, it was meant that this network will uh, remain vital and active even past EC support. And therefore we established a so-called European Research Group that was uh, loosely associated to the European Forestry Institute. And this network, uh, which is still ongoing and alive, as you can see, uh, is now made up of uh, 30 European research institutions and universities that are all involved in research and evolutionary biology in forest ecosystems with a focus on trees and their associated organisms. So the, main, the main activities of Evil Tree involve like primarily knowledge exchange on various ways. Uh, this can be through funding small projects that also foster mobility among labs, uh, if allowed. Uh, conference visits are supported. Uh, we are sharing infrastructure. Uh, several databases have been established and are being maintained. And one really important part of our activities are training courses, uh, workshops uh, and the like. And one kind of such training activities is this seminar series now. So the second round um, of uh, the seminar series uh, deals with climate change adaptation. And it's related to evolutionary genetics and gen genomics in view of the ongoing and forthcoming changes that we uh, envisage in terms of land use change, climate change, climate warming, and so forth. So there will be these four seminars in April and May that you probably all registered to, registered to already. 
So today's talk, uh, the opening session uh, is given by Ari Hoffman, and I'm very glad to actually see Ari the first time. Uh, of course, uh, I'm familiar with his uh, seminal work uh, that he has done, uh, particularly his review articles that are very uh, informative, very helpful for people getting into the topic. Um, dealing with evolutionary genetics in view of adaptation to climate change. And a bit to a surprise to me, when I checked uh, his web page and the information on the web, uh, I noticed that there's a lot of other topics that I was not aware of that he's into, be it um, inse insecticide resistance, uh, of course, conservation genetics, and other topics. So it seems that R is really a very versatile and biodiverse uh, person. And this makes him really well adapted to actually initiate this seminar series. And I very much look forward to hearing your talk, Ari. Please take over. Thanks very much, Felix, for those um, generous words. So people often ask me what I am, and I just say biologist these days. <laughs> it makes it easier. So hopefully you can see my screen now. Um, so what, what I wanted to do today was to sort of cover you know, a fairly broad area. And um, what I really wanted to do was to sort of contrast, if you like, two types of issues that we have when we think about building resilience, genetic resilience. And um, certainly, you know, at this stage of my career, I'm very interested in much more the applied aspects and how we can use very good science to inform the applied aspects. I think, you know, we're at a critical phase from a biodiversity point of view, we're at a critical phase from a food production point of view. And um, what we need to do is to try and bring our science to bear in terms of resolving these issues. So that's sort of what drives me. And that's why I've become a bit of a diverse biologist, if you like, Felix, because, you know, I think we can apply certain evolutionary thinking in a range of different disciplines. And that's what pushes me ahead these days. So what I wanted to do today was to talk a bit about the work we've been doing on threatened species and talk about some of the general principles of my experience in this area. And I also wanted to talk a bit about, you know, a couple of keystone species that we've been recently working on um, to give you a bit of an idea about how we think about the problems and how we can actually go forward with them. And I'll be covering, you know, some of the work that a number of people have done that I'll introduce as we go along the way. So that's what I'm hoping to achieve. So the first, um, sorry, I'm just quite sure my slide's not changing. Hang on a sec, I was working before. What's going on here? Here we go. Just use the old arrows. So, you know, the first thing that, that obviously comes to mind when you think about climate change that, is that it's destructive, um, and it leads to massive impacts. And this is one example that's arisen locally here in the last couple of weeks. So this is a species called Eucalyptus porcaflora. So it's what we call a snow gum. And it's the one that you find at the tree line. You know, our tree line is similar to your tree line in terms of elevation and conditions, but obviously the species we have at the tree line is totally different. So you get these sort of bushy Eucalyptus porcaflora coming there. And what you'll notice, obviously, is that these guys are dying. And um, there's a bit of regrowth here, but in actual fact, most of this tree is dead. And eventually that tree will simply become a skeleton. So what's going on here? Well, you know, you think, oh gosh, you know, it's hot or it's dry or something like that. You know, climate change is acting. But of course, you know, typically what we see in climate change is that we have a, a complexity of factors. We never quite know what's going on a lot of the time until we do the science to understand the situation. And in this particular case, it's a particular, um, it's, it's a burrower, so it's an insect that is effectively ring barking these trees. So it's effectively a situation where you have a ring barking event that's happening and it's, it's a long corn beetle. So it's a beetle species that's burrowing inside these trees and it's killing these trees. And of course, the reason why it's doing that, and it hasn't done that in the last, you know, couple of hundred thousand years at least, is that um, you've got climate change happening and the beetles coming out earlier, the beetles are able to live for longer, 
this area is covered by snow. Um, so it just pops out earlier, and does more damage. And unfortunately, the natural enemies of this beetle don't come out at the same time. And this is the result. So this is a big deal for us because these are, you know, very important ecosystems from a biodiversity point of view. We're about to lose this tree cover um, potentially for a large part of our alpine area. So climate change is complex. You never quite know what's going on. You need to do the science to understand this. Sometimes you get a good handle on it, sometimes you don't. And it's going to be something that hits you in the face when it happens. And it won't be exactly simple ecologically. But of course, it won't be simple from an evolutionary point of view either. The selection pressures that are acting here are quite complicated. And, you know, and that's the first thing that I always try and get across to people, that these things are not simple. So, so clearly, you know, we're at the stage where and we're at the start of you know what we call our, our next mass extinction event. So we've had three extinctions so far attributed directly to climate change, probably a few more that should be attributed but haven't been. And you know, and there are animals at this stage, um, but that list is obviously going to increase in the next few years because we have plenty of situations of populations being in decline. So from a threatened species point of view, um, what we're concerned about is the fact that these species are going to be increasingly threatened as climate change hits. And you know, you've seen lots of papers that predict that by 2050 or 2080, particularly 2080, the majority of threatened species from many plant and animal groups are going to potentially be lost. So there's various estimates of that. Now, those sorts of predictions really are sort of based on SDMs, on species distribution models. You know, so someone comes along and says, well, you know, there's a correlation between climate and the distribution of the species, the climate's going to change, and hence the species is going to change in its distribution, and eventually there won't be any suitable habitat left, and hence we can predict the extinction of that species based on those sorts of models. And you know, as a consequence, of course, there's a rush at the moment to try and get some of the threatened species incorporated into vulnerability assessments, and those um, assessments are happening as we speak. Um, they've been developed for a range of animal groups and plant groups around the world and they continue to be developed. Now, what those vulnerability assessments don't consider most of the time is evolution and genetics. You know, they're really based on ecological principles, SDMs, and they don't really consider genetics and the potential of these species to adapt. And, you know, I've certainly spent part of my life in the last 15 years trying to convince the people doing these sorts of things to start considering genetics and evolution as part of the principles. And, you know, I think it's a game we're slowly starting to win, but I think we have a long way to go. So that's a little bit by way of introduction, um, threatened species uh, potentially going extinct. We've got some on the record now that are certainly decreasing in many situations they are becoming more threatened as a consequence of climate change. I don't think anyone can doubt that, but there are ways, of course, of biting back. So in Australia, we have situations where, you know, our doom and gloom merchants um, in the biology area certainly um, focus mostly on animals at the stage. So, you know, so Tim Flannery has been an excellent voice in this area. Um, you know, he's, he's made a number of predictions about what will happen. So one of his canaries in the coal mine, um, in other words, you know, the one that indicates that extinction more generally is likely um, is a species called a mountain pygmy possum. So that's one of his canaries in the clove mine. And he says that, well, when that happens, you know, there'll be a whole lot of other species that will also be going down the tube. And in that particular case, he's pushing the snow as the, um, you know, as, as the factor responsible. But of course, you know, there are other opinions around that. So, so Mike Archer, and, and Haley Bates have said, well, you know, mountain pygmy possums could be saved because, you know, we've got some fossils from some areas, lowland forest, where we've also found these things in the past. And maybe if we shifted the possums to that area, they might be okay. So mountain pygmy possums are one of these species that, um, based on species distribution models, they have a very, very limited um, habitat that they about that a little bit more in a sec. Um, and, you know, we, we want to know whether they were going to go down to Google or not, um, or what can we do to save them? And, you know, there's these different opinions around that. 
So these opinions generally do not consider evolution. They don't consider adaptation at all. Um, and I think that's something that we need to do. So evolutionary adaptation, of course, is acknowledged as being potentially important. Um, no doubt most of the participants in, in these um, fora will appreciate that. But of course, often the general population doesn't and often many biologists don't. So there's still this idea out there, unfortunately, that evolution is a very slow process. You know, and we know that it can happen very quickly. We know it can take just a few generations. And, you know, and we know that obviously in many plants and also many animals, you get these, you know, very strong dif genetic differentiation across various clines of sorts. And, um, you know, we know that based on many experimental results and many um, longitudinal studies, Lots of species have a great potential to adapt to new conditions. So it can happen quickly, it's common, and of course it does depend on a few things. You know, you've got to have the right variation. Large amounts of variation usually equal rapid adaptive potential. And of course, gene flow is one of those processes that's critical in this whole process. So if you've got new genes coming to the population, if the population is there thereby or without gene flow carrying lots of genetic variation, then of course, all our theory tells us that we expect evolution to occur and to be maximized. And in a sense, from a threatened species point of view, what we really need to do is to try and recreate those conditions as much as possible. And along the way, we'll have lots of interesting side effects as well, such as decreasing the potential of inbreeding to have an impact on fitness. Now, you know, there's, there's always a couple of people out there that challenge this idea, but it really is, is the basis for um, threatened species conservation, and it's probably still a very good foundation to play with. So here's an example of the sort of power of this approach. You have to go to a model system to demonstrate this. So this is, I'll just give you one example. This is some work that Michael Orsted and Torsten Christensen that a picture there I was involved with when they came to visit Melbourne and my lab. We set this up and we organized these experiments. And, you know, we use flies for this because you can run very large fly experiments. And in particular, what we wanted to do is we wanted to generate the first very solid data set on SNP polymorphisms where you could really assess genetic variation accurately across the genome and see what happens when you vary that to a large extent. We had 128 populations and you select and see, well, you know, does it really predict selective potential? So we did this very large experiment. We varied the genetic diversity, had a genomic diversity along the x-axis, and we selected for a bunch of different traits. And so the experimental design is sort of given left, left there. You've got to, you're basically exposing these to a stress. You then reduce the size of these populations, select and act, so you get rapid evolution. And what you start off with is a population, a set of populations that have a great variation in the amount of genetic variation they have or genomic variation they have. So one of these classic ideas has been around for a long time. That's what we assume, but it hasn't been rigorously tested. So what we then did is we then measured adaptation over a number of generations. And what we pretty much got was a straight line relationship between the amount of genetic diversity you had in these 128 populations and the extent to which this trait body size changed under selection. So there, was, there were other traits that showed the same pattern. The more variation you've got, the better you are at adapting to these stressful conditions that we were exposing these flies to. And you know, and SNP polymorphisms give you an excellent measure of genomic variation in terms of making these predictions. Very, very tight association. It was actually shocked me how tight it was. So, you know, so a lot of people have done this in the past. There's a nice paper by Market, for instance, on these crustaceans. And, you know, what Market did is again set up, you know, genetic variation varying from one times to eight times and complete admixture, as it kind of indicated along the top here. And, you know, and 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 that group was stressing, was stressing these particular crustaceans, and they had two treatments. This was a stress treatment, this was the less stressful treatment, and they measured extinction times. So you've got genetic variation, you've got populations that vary a measuring extinction time along here. And of course, you know, what that shows very convincingly is that when you have a lot of variation, your extinction time goes up quite markedly, particularly under a stressful condition. So here we have a very short extinction time, 
And by the time we get complete ag mixture of these populations, we have a much longer extinction zone. So pretty much from a few generations all the way to 80 generations. So, you know, so these are sorts of data give us confidence that, you know, even if we're not measuring adaptive variation, then of course, we still have a pretty good prediction as to what will go extinct and what doesn't go extinct under stressful conditions. So of course, you know, this allows us to be confident that we can recommend that, you know, if you really want to take advantage of genetic variation, you know, aiding in climate change adaptation, you've got to build up your variation. So we've tested this in a, a few cases now. And, um, and this is one that, that um, Andrew Weeks led and this is a mountain, this is a, an organism called mountain pygmy possum, which is the one I mentioned previously in relation to the term Flannery, uh, Mike Archer debates. So this is an endangered marsupial population. And um, Paul Matroski did a lot of the early work on this and Elf, um, who was a, a Thai um, postdoc, did a lot of the, the later work on this. So these people contributed to this work and this was published um, in 19, sorry, 2017. And um, there's a follow-up paper that's going to appear shortly. So mountain pygmy possum is interesting because it has a disjunct range, which is typical of threatened species. Uh, you know, it's very cute. It's sort of, you know, you, pick, you can pick them up by the tail, you can sit them on your body, and, you know, it's very nice to see. And there are three disjunct areas. So in Australia, this is, you know, you think about Australia and Victoria, so this is where I am here, and we have mountains up here. And we have three disjunct areas where this occurs. So there's this lower mountain range, which we call Bulla. And then we have this area here, which we call the, the Bogon High Plains. And then we have Mount Kosciuszko here, which is the highest peak in Australia. And um, so those are the three areas that we're talking about. You've got a disjunct um, population. And if you put a molecular clock on this, on mitochondrial genes, then you're talking about, you know, probably 15,000 or so uh, years between the separation of these guys here and longer between the separation process here. So these populations have been isolated for a large number of years and also a large number of generations because, you know, after one or two years, you can get breeding in these guys quite happily. So the Mount Buller populations, I'm talking this one down here, was recently discovered. And unfortunately, from a genetic point of view, we noted that when we started doing the genetics a long time ago, it's back in 2008, um, this is microsatellite markers, we found that the allele free, uh, richness and the heterozygosity was crashing in these populations. So this is a very, very sharp decrease in heterozygosity um, over a period of just seven years. So in seven years, you've gone from an allelic richness and heterozygosity, well, in this case, close to five to, to you know, below two very, very quick. So you've lost more than half your variation. In fact, the heterozygosity, you've actually lost about 80% of your heterozygosity. And that is a consequence of a change in population size. Um, this population was operating at a reduced size. So in this particular case, it wasn't actually climate change that was directly responsible, but it was probably, you know, we don't really know the case, but it was probably the fact that we had some habitat destruction going on um, as a consequence of people putting in ski, ski runs. So here we have a situation where this white line indicates the distribution of one of these populations, the mountain pygmy possum, and the black lines here indicate ski lifts, and then you've got your dotted lines indicating the ski runs going down the slope. So unbeknownst to these people, they were putting ski runs in the middle of mountain pygmy possum habits, which is probably not such a bad thing to do, Excepting that when people like to um, ski downhill, they don't like to encounter these sorts of what we call bowler fields. And these bowler fields, these big rocky fields, turn out to be quite critical for the hibernation of this particular species um, during the winter time. So you've got a situation where the authorities were effectively bulldozing these bowler fields and destroying habitat on the way through. So, what do we do about that? Well, you know based on everything I've just been showing you before, you want to try, if you want to try and build resilience, you've got to try and boost your new variation. You don't want it crashing to 20% of what it was because that population will eventually go extinct. It's lacking evolutionary capacity and it's also going to show inbreeding depression if you leave it like that. 
So in that case, you know, we, we first consulted the IUCN guidelines about translocations. And of course, you know, at that stage, the word genetics was not mentioned in these guidelines. So this is the, the classic guidelines you have for a threatened species. And, you know, there was no mention of genetic resilience or anything like that at all in those guidelines. So that causes a bit unaware. So, so what we decided to do was we decided to move some individuals from this area, this middle area here where the genetic variation was staying high. So if you go back to this earlier slide, you can see that, you know, this is this middle area, the variation is absolutely fine. And unlike this target area, we decided to move a few males from here to here. And I have to admit that we got into a bit of a fight uh, with the, the zoo. You know, these things are never easy to do. And the zoo said, oh, well, what we can do is we can take these individuals and we can breed them captively and save the species, you know, a typical response that you might get from a zoo. And, um, you know, I'm not saying... You know, I think it's probably just limited thinking. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to be negative about the zoo, but you know, because zoos can perform a very useful conservation function. But in this case, they wanted to save this by rearing this in captivity before it collapsed and disappeared. So we said, no, no, what you could do genetically to build resilience is just move a few individuals across here. And, um, and that's effectively what we did after a lot of work. And so 2008, the problem appeared, 2000, and 12, we finally got permission to do some of the first translocations and we started getting hybrids appearing. And lo and behold, these hybrids had a pretty good fitness, um, 2.6 times the fitness of the nine hybrids in that population. So just moving a few males created hybrids and those hybrids had a very, very high fitness compared to what was already there. And that's an effect that persisted you know, in a, in a later generation as well. And we've got some more data subsequent to that that's also persisted. So you've got a situation where the hybrids are fitter, they're leaving more offspring, and you know we're able to track these guys using genetic markers, and we're able to also measure, you know, do phenotypic measurements such as tail size, and you can see that in both sexes you're getting this difference between the hybrids and the non-hybrids in tail size. You know, the hybrids are bigger, so they, you know, these are the hybrids here. The bigger than what was originally present, um, and that leads to a more robust individual that can leave more offspring and survive better. So we're pretty happy about that. And of course, the proof is in the pudding, as they say. And um, here's the population size. So I was crashing. I mean, these are estimated. You know, this, this indirect data based on trapping. That's a bit rough, but you can see it's absolutely going up and up and up. And this population is now stabilized around here somewhere and it's doing very well. So these two translocations led to an increase in population size. At the same time, and this is important, it, it, you know, the authorities that had bulldozed those boulder fields were also creating new habitat. So we were, we were boosting the genetics, but we had a double boost. We made habitat and we boosted the genetics. The habitat itself wasn't enough but the genetics really helps sort of push this population to a very healthy state. And of course, you know, these days we use SNPs and this is work that's unpublished, but you know, we've done a lot of work with SNPs measuring this in great detail. And this is pretty much what happened. The observed heterozygosity has gone up very nicely. These are the introduced individuals that we put in the population. You can separate them out because they have a very high heterozygosity. And you can see that that's flown through all the way through to 2017. And this has persisted into later years as well. And of course, these individuals that you introduced eventually die. And this is just the death of these individuals. And they've now all disappeared from the population. They persist for a number of years. So that's, you know, that's boosting variation, increasing fitness. But importantly, we now think that this population is more resilient to evolutionary problems, sorry, evolution, allowing an evolutionary change to occur in the future, be it to reduce snow cover or something else, whatever might go on. And, and you know, the issue with climate change, as I said at the beginning, is you never quite know what's going to happen. So at the moment, we have a situation where we are starting to see climate change affecting the main food source that mountain pygmy possums use to fatten up before they go into hibernation. So what's happening here is we have bogon, bogon moths and the bogon moths like to spend the summertime in a cool environment. And what they do is they actually migrate and there are masses of bogon moths. This is actually a massive moth, believe it or not. And it's sitting on the top of these rocks, these boulder field rocks. 
And what the mountain pygmy possum come along and is they eat these. So they eat these moths and they fatten up before the winter sets on. And these were actually also a very important food source for Aborigines in the past. You know, they're full of protein, full of fat. And if you eat these, you can keep them nice and warm across the winter. But what's happening under climate change is these moth flights are starting to disappear. They're starting to decrease. So we have this problem and, you know, it's clear that the mountain pygmy possum in the future is going to have to adapt to a new food source to allow them to fatten up, to, to deal with these sorts of issues. And, um, you know, and that's something that we're looking at at the moment. But, you know, you need to prepare for the fact that there are going to be unpredictable effects of climate change. You never quite know what's going to happen. So you're better off just boosting genetic variation generally in order to get across these sorts of um, problems. So we learned a lot from this. You know, we could return genetic variation very easily, very cheaply too. In fact, you know, we it only costs a few tens of thousands of dollars, whereas captive breeding would have cost a few million. So it's a very cheap approach. And of course, you know, we're building adaptive capacity. We're getting rid of inbreeding. A few individuals will really push, push, you know, push this massively. And um, and we were able to, of course, in this case, select a population where genetic variation was high, and the genetic distance to the Mount Buller population was low. And we did it across two years. So we also minimized the effects of outbreeding oppression in this case. And we haven't seen any outbreeding oppression occurring in this population at all to date. So it's a good news story. It works. And of course, it leads to this whole issue of genetic mixing more generally for population management. And you know, this is a review that we just recently put out that Andrew is involved, I'm involved, and Adam, Adam Miller is the other person who's involved in this review. But we're trying to make some recommendations in terms of pushing this through. And um, you know, we, th we think this is the way to go. And you know, this, we're not the only people doing this, of course. There's lots of other very nice data appearing in, in the literature, such as you know, Sarah Fitzpatrick's work um, showing that this is in fish, you know, showing that again. This hybridization between populations leads to high fitness individuals when you've got a certain proportion of the hybrid, the genotype present. So, you know, so we think this is an approach that could be used, for instance, when we've done our assessments of threatened marsupials in Australia, they're probably around half of the threatened marsupials currently, and probably more fish and probably many insects and also many other species that are threatened. You know, we think it's a good general approach that can really build resilience into the future. So the real question for us now is, you know, how far can you go out? So, so the mountain pygmy possum, as I said, was sort of separated by 13 to 15,000 years, but what happens when we go further? So one of our targets at the moment is this bandicoot, Eastern Mount Bandicoot, you know, very pretty marsupial. And this is taken from the, the these are records from the Australian um, Atlas, Atlas of Living Australia. So these are records that we have around Australia. And effectively, all these populations up here on the mainland have gone extinct. There is a captive, there are two captive populations in Victoria, which are remnant populations, but that's all that's left of this very wide distribution in Australia. On the other hand, the Tasmanian populations of Bandicoot are still widespread and there's quite a lot of them. So you've got a situation where this particular species has persisted here and not here. But people and that people decided to call this this different subspecies. So you've got one subspecies up here that's gone extinct in the field, still present captively, and you've got another subspecies here. So the question then becomes, well, what do we do, right? Do we jump this barrier here? It's more than 15,000 years, you know, will it still work? And this is, you know, this is something that I think we really need to answer because this is what will allow you to build up more resilience in the future. And um, that's why we started doing crosses between these. Tasmania versus Victoria. And, you know, and at this stage we have very healthy F3s sitting there and they've only, and they've just started being released in captive areas um, that are fenced off. And eventually we want to throw them out in the wild because the Victorian populations are genetically the pauper. They're showing inbreeding effects and they have no resilience left whatsoever. So it's really a question of how far can we push this out and I think the more we do this, the more we learn, and of course, the more useful that becomes for um, helping to guide conservation efforts into the future. All right, so that's where I want to park threatened species. And I now want to shift my focus because, you know, we've also been doing work on these keystone species.
So, you know, so these are obviously species that are critically important for ecosystem function. They're often widespread, locally adapted. And of course, you know, if you lose them, then you get a cascade of effects on the ecosystem. So those snow gums, that snow gum example I started off with, is really an example of a keystone species where if you're losing that species, you're going to have a cascade of effects further down the track of all the birds and the lower plants and all sorts of other things that rely on that species habitat. So that's the challenge. So what you really want to do is to look at the long-term persistence of keystone species and build resilience into those species if you can at all help it. So this is an area that's becoming pretty critical in Australia is around the world. And you know, we are seeing a lot of damage in Australia. So this is just an example of some of the eucalyptus forests um, in Western Australia in this case here. And you know, this is this is actually high temperature damage. We're seeing quite a lot of high temperature damage in these eucalypts. And we're also seeing damage due to you know outbreaks, not so much of those beetles, but different types of insects on the leaves that are also damaging the foliage and leading to eventual tree death. So we're having silids and lerps that are attacking these eucalypts as well. So we're seeing direct heat damage, direct drought damage as well. And we're also seeing in insect damage starting to happen. So, you know, so this is serious. And of course, the problem is that if you're going to act, you've got to act now. I mean, if you wait another 10 years, it'll be too late. You'll never get anything in the ground. So I, you know, I've been, banging on at this to various regulators and, and I've had little success so far, but I've won, I had a few small victories, but they are pretty small at this stage. So, so what do you do about it? Well, the first thing that we normally throw at them is we, we take the long-term forestry plots that were set up, setting up, that were set up around eucalypts and um, say, look at what's happened to some of the local provenances versus the non-local provenances. So in other words, the local genotypes of trees that were put in many years ago versus genotypes that, that were introduced from a long way away. And, um, you know, and these obviously these plots were, were not set up for climate change. They were set up to say, well, you know, what genotype of tree should we plant here for timber production or for shelter belt production or some other reason. But they have nevertheless provided some interesting lessons. So here, here's an example of one of these plots. And this plot has been going for 35 years. It is an eucalypt species, and this is work that Brad Plotz in Tasmania set up a number of years ago and has been monitoring for a long period of time. And, and Brad's work shows that, firstly, you have the local provenance, so this is the local genotypes, you put them out into a cleared area, you say, well, how well do these trees do? And you know, for the first 15 to 20 years, these trees were doing remarkably well better than your no local provenances as indicated by these blue dots here. But then we had a drought, we had a series of droughts and then the situation changed. And all of a sudden the local provenances, you know, these are droughts that are unheard of, right? You know, droughts that have been around for a long, long time. The local provenance just started dying off. Whereas some of the, some of the non-local ones actually did remarkably well. So in actual fact, these guys here, are, you know, in a sense, drought resistance, whereas these ones here are dying off or what, you know, it might be the direct effects of drought, it might be the indirect effects of drought, but certainly some effects related to droughts. And of course, you know, in my part of the world, droughts are becoming more severe, they're lasting longer, and they are occurring more often as a consequence of climate change variability. So you throw that sort of data at them and then you say, look, you know, what we need to do is we need to think about the situation with respect to these keystone species that are critically important in our ecosystems. So here's an example of a keystone species, which is a eucalyptus species called Microcarpa, and it's called grey box and it has a very wide distribution, South Australia all the way through to New South Wales. So, you know, very wide distribution, distributed species. And here we are in Melbourne, this is where I am. and um, this is a site I'll talk about in just a sec. So it's a wide species, very important ecologically, supports a lot of life. It's, it's actually been affected quite a lot by agriculture because this is an agricultural belt here. So you do have remnant stands and that's a problem. Um, and some areas you've actually lost most of the cover of this particular tree and that is a problem as well, which I'll come back to a little bit later. So, Beck Jordan, you know, came across, she, she was a PhD student. She approached me, you know, a few years ago, quite a few years ago now and said, oh, I'm interested in 
climate change and and eucalypts and you know i'm a passionate plant person i said well you know um maybe we can set something up so we eventually set up something with a couple of you know very good Saro scientists, um, Suzanne Prober and Shannon Dillon. And we started looking at this, this eucalyptus microcarpa and, you know, and firstly doing some landscape genomics to look at the diversity and to look at some adaptation in the landscape. So we, at the time, we didn't have a common garden experiment with these trees. We didn't have a forestry stand that we could go for, but we eventually did discover one, which was quite nice. Um, but you know, this was one of these interesting situations where we initially didn't. So we said, right, you know, let's do the genomics, let's see what we get. So what we did was we collected a whole lot of populations of the microcarpa um, from across its species range. And of course, then we extracted the DNA and asked the question, well, do we get any evidence for genomic differentiation across that range linked to climates? And the answer that you typically get for, for a tree like this is you do. So here we have, you know, here's a bunch of SNPs, a couple of SNPs. We were doing dart sequencing at the time, which is a common method that's used in Australia to, to do this sort of work. And we found that a number of these SNPs were associated with annual temperature. And we also had some that were associated with aridity. So, you know, so we had some signal of genetic differentiation and we were able to, of course, also look at neutral variation, so third codon position variation, and show that these were real effects. So this wasn't some population process, it wasn't some migration event. It was really a case where we had some really clear adaptive SNPs in the eucalyptus microcarpa. So we know that these trees have adapted, and we also know that adaptation has involved SNPs across the full G excuse me, genome of the species. So we've got 11 chromosomes, and you can see that there's a whole bunch of markers to temperature and precipitation aridity scattered throughout the genome. So, you know, unsurprisingly, we're talking about a complex polygenic trait, which is typically what you get in these situations. And of course, this um, project was done in the, well, started in the mid, in the mid um, 2010s. So we were only, um, reduced representation sequencing. So we're only sequencing a small part of the genome to get these markers. So there's a whole lot more that we're missing, obviously, but there are plenty there to play with. So this species has become a critical species from a revegetation point of view, unsurprisingly, because it performs, it's a keystone species. So when people try and plant, you know, try and revegetate, they plant a lot of this particular species, right? They want to get out there and get it in the ground so they can then attract their birds and bats and bugs and what have you. So here's some revegetation stands that are, that are just photographs showing you the range of what you typically get. And this, these are taken by Beck. And, you know, and unfortunately, some of these stands are not doing too well. So what we're getting is we're getting climate related, climate related dieback of these trees. So people are planting them, but they're dying back. And all this work, all this planting focuses on local genotypes, what we call local provenancing. So people collect seed from the area where they're trying to revegetate. They grow up the seedlings from that seed and they stick them in the ground and then they monitor them. And then we're getting this sort of death happening. You know, it's pretty tragic. Because don't forget that, you know, the, some of these blocks are set up by volunteers and there's nothing worse than spending, you know, days of your life planting these trees, thinking like you're doing the right thing. And then, of course, a big drought comes along or a big insect attack comes along or a heat wave comes along and knocks them out. So, you know, very disheartening, big problem. And of course, it erodes public confidence in these sorts of critically important exercises where a lot of our land has been denuded where the species traditionally occurred. So I'll just talk briefly about one of the efforts to try and do something about this. So this is work that Gary McDonald led, and this is an organization called Bush Heritage. So it's an NGO, a non-government organization. And, and I, I started giving, I was giving a number of talks um, around Australia, particularly in my state, you know, on trying to build evolutionary resilience and why that was worthwhile. And, um, and eventually this helped trigger this project in Nadu Hills. So this photo I've got here is actually in Nadu Hills. So these people, which is, this, you know, they bought this land, this Bush Heritage, this organization that bought this land and they were seeing their trees dying. And of course they wanted to do something different. 
So, so Gary became involved and very enthusiastic along with a bunch of other people. And they said, look, you know, let's try it out. So at that time, there was an idea around, you know, which we were contributing to as well as other people like Linda Broadhurst and, and Leslie Hughes. And this is an idea of climate ready vegetation. So what you could do is if you were trying to plant trees and you knew that those trees had adaptive variation like microcarpa, what you could do is you could actually source genotypes from a longer climate gradient and you could try and match them to the future. So you could say, look, you know, these trees have to survive for the next 50 years. You know, it's now 2020. So I'm going to go out and source genotypes from stickermen that I know that are going to survive in 2070. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to pre-adapt, if you like, genetic variation from climate to provenancy. But you have to be careful because climate is not everything. You know, as we just talked about at the beginning, just think back to that second slide. You know, there's an unpredictability about climate. So, you, so what you really want to do is to try and go fairly broad. So it's fine matching climate, but you have to do a few other things as well, I think. So the idea is to take this location here and then try and put some of these genotypes from here into it, some from here into it, and then hopefully the next time there's a drought or an insect attack or a, or a um, heat wave comes along, then you're going to have some of those individuals that are going to actually survive. So... Current temperature, 15 degrees, plus one, plus two. You can source them based on that. And in this particular case, we source from a number of populations. And we also were looking at variation within populations. So we made sure, this again is unusual in revegetation, that we were sourcing stock from a number of mother trees when we were setting up this design. So this, is, this here is the area that we're targeting. So we've got some local provenances as indicated here. So we're talking about two species, yellow box and gray box. So gray box is the one I've been talking about. Yellow box is another critically important tree. And we also had some way out provenances. So these are the ones that are climate matched, these ones up here. And then we wanted to create a bit of variation. So we also saw some ones here. So we're bringing all these provenances into the site and setting it up for the future. That's the hope. It's a big site thousands of trees, and that's what we were trying to do. So the design looks a bit like this. We wanted to make it a rigorous design, lots of blocks, lots of provenances, and lots of families in each provenance and replica trees. And of course, all randomized to blocks. It looks a bit like this. So here we have our provenances, and here we have one block, and we had 10 of these blocks. So, so you get an idea about the sort of scale you can do these things in at this particular site. So. It's set up. We learned a lot of lessons along the way. When we set up all the seedlings, we had a, a major drought come in and we lost 75% of our seedlings in the first year. So that's the sort of thing you have to deal with. You know, it's interesting, these practical exercises are very different to science. You know, it's, it's quite a disheartening effort. But, you know, we are already starting to see, this is height, we're starting to see some, even at year one, after one year of growth, we're starting to see some differences appear among the provenances, small differences so far, but you know, these blocks, plots um, are indicating some differences developing and, um, and a couple of the provenances from a long way away after that very tough year are already starting to um, perform better than the local provenances in this particular case. And it's quite exciting. And is a good message, I think, even this very early stage. So, what we want to do, of course, is we want to set up a lot more of these, you know. I mean, I want to set up 100 of these plots scattered around my state, dealing with a range of different ecosystems. And, of course, you know, we're not the only people doing this. And, you know, obviously California oak, again, people are doing this sort of genetic work to show there's lots of variation within populations for dealing with particular stressful conditions. And you can track that variation with genomes very well. And, of course, you can then use it in assist the gene flow projects. So you're really helping to create gene flow across these very large climate gradients um, to try and pre-adapt these species that are critically important for the landscape. So I think, you know, I think hopefully this is catching now and it's very important to do, and, but it takes a lot of work to convince the regulatory authorities to allow it. And we've made some progress, but we still have a lot more to do. And then of course, you've still got to fund it. And at the moment, the funding for us comes from a, you know, a non-government organization, rather a government organization at this stage. 
All right. So, you know, so there's lots of fancy tools coming on board. And, you know, I, I've just talked about some examples of what you can do. And obviously, you know, there's a whole lot of other things that are emerging. So there's this whole notion of genomic vulnerability that's arisen where you can assess the vulnerability along climate gradients. So, you know, so we can do complicated things at the genotypic level. We can do complicated things on genotype environment interactions. And of course, we can do much more complicated things at the environment level. So there are models coming on board. The climate models are improving. The species distributional models are improving. The genomics is improving. We're getting more candidate genes. And they will help us improve, you know, what goes into these types of exercises. And I think that's a very potent approach that we can use. So we can bring the genomics together with what the ecologists do, and we can combine observations with genomic tools, and then we can, of course, start looking for outcomes. So we can make predictions and look at outcomes and learn from these predictions. And of course, you know, that will then allow us to sort of validate what we're actually doing. So that's, you know, that's, I think, is the future. But of course, it's complicated. And, um, you know, we ended up this review saying, look, you know, life's not going to be easy, right? You've got a recipient population, recipient population, you've got source populations, and you've got the future populations, right? And you're trying to connect all those up. And of course, you're trying to then make deliberations and decisions based on connecting all those up. And there's a whole lot of factors that you need to consider regardless of whether you're talking about a threatened animal or a threatened plant or a keystone species that's essential to the environment. But I think, you know, I think it's important to have these conversations. And it's very important for people with evolutionary knowledge to sit in the middle of these discussions and to really have an influence in terms of what's important here. So you've got to accept the fact that there are going to be other inputs, you know, be they disease risk and cultural context and all sorts of things, but you've got to be at the bench talking to these people because eventually, of course, we need to make sure that we have the best outcome. We need to build resilience into the future. We're facing a catastrophe and we need to be able to use evolution to get ourselves out of trouble as much as possible, as well as all the other tools that we currently have available, which include, of course, creating as much habitat as possible. So on that note, I'll leave you again with where I started to illustrate the sorts of issues that you have to deal with and think about, and the fact that it's always going to be complex, but of course, polygenic, complicated genomic responses are possible to all these things and are going to be critical in the long run. Thank you. Oh, I'm not muted. No, it's okay. Oh, I unmuted myself, but I think I was put back where I was not allowed to do that. So anyways, no, thank you. Thank you, Ari, for this broad perspective um, on what evolutionary uh, research can contribute to uh, conservation of rare species. And of course, we... Most of us liked also the all the tree examples, I guess. So with this, well, I think, yeah, yeah, and I, and I put those in because I know that this, you know, <laughs> this is your interest, of course. But I mean, you know, we, I mean, I work across organisms, as you know, and I think, you know, I think these are critically important things to set up. So yeah, oh, and I know some of you guys are thinking about this and doing this, and, but I also know that some of you people are having big challenges, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So much of that was familiar to. Many of us, I guess. Yeah. So I would like to open the floor for questions. Uh, and at best, you raise your hand uh, by going to the reactions icon and choose raise your hand or whatever that is in English. I don't know. I have a German version here. So I can see who is ready to ask a question. Otherwise, you can also chat, uh, write your question into the chat, and I'll try to keep track of your questions. So anyone with a question? With this, you can avoid 
me asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> Katarina, I see your hand raising, but try to do this uh, in Zoom so I can see it on my participants window. But that's fine, Katarina, uh, unmute yourself and let's hear. Katarina, you cannot unmute yourself. Okay, no. it works. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you very much. And thank you very much for this interesting talk. Uh, it was uh, really great to see what you have already been trying out and what is apparently also working. I have a question about the gray box woodland um, system. So you, yeah. you mentioned that the local seed sources that they used for planting at the beginning, that they were dying off. And I was wondering how did they actually introduce these trees? Were that, did that did actually uh, the selection happen uh, at the very early seedling stages or did they plant them in a greenhouse and then plant them out later? And how are you handling this now with your provenances? Because I think the yep. selection in the very early stages is really important in trees. And I think yep. it, it might make a big difference. And yeah, I was wondering how, how are you doing that? Yeah, so the original Nadu Hills trees were a few years old and that's when they died actually. So, um, you know, certainly with respect to these gray boxes, once you get a lot of pressure, combination of drought, heat waves, well, particularly drought in this case, and, and some insects attack, you know, you do kill five-year-old trees, right? You really do. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's, it's surprising how easy it is. I'm not saying that at seedlings, you don't get a lot of selection, don't get me wrong, but these trees were established. You wouldn't have expected them to keel over, right? That's the problem. Um, so what happened, what typically happened in this case, and this is also what we did for the trial. So you, you go out, you collect seed, you then bring it back to a nursery and then you culture it at the nursery, right? You grow at the nursery. And of course we wanted to make sure that we had a similar environment at the nursery. So we brought the seed back to one nursery, right? To make sure it was a common environment before we planted them out. So that was the approach that was used in this particular case. Um, but, you know, we've already seen a situation where of course, we have lost three quarters of our seedlings, right? And that was actually not particularly, it was not, it was interesting because I, I thought it might've been indicated by the provenance. We're seeing the provenance effects emerging now, but not originally, not at the seedling stage. So, you know, it may, it may be the case that something else was going on, but it seemed to be almost random, which is kind of interesting, kind of weird. But certainly the genotypic effects are starting to show up now. We also did get big family differences and the family differences, of course, may be genetics and maybe carryover effects, right? We don't quite know, you know, there could be epistatic effects as well there, epi um, genetic effects as well there. But we did see differences that were big among some of the families. Yeah, definitely, yeah. So I think, I think you've got variation, two sources of variation. In terms of early survival, the family variation was bigger, the, the within population variation was bigger than the provenance variation. In terms of height now, it looks like the provenance variation is becoming bigger. Yeah. But yeah, six, five, six, seven, eight year old trees are dying. Yeah. And um, I, don't, I don't know if you remember that slide that I showed you of those, uh, the, you know, the, that aeroplane shot, right? Those are mature, you know, that's, that's mature Jarrah forest, right? <laughs> These are very <laughs> tall trees. You know, you're talking about trees that are 30, 40, 50 years old and they're still dying, right? So yeah. I, I think I think we'll be on. I, I agree with what you're saying, but I think we'll be on that. I think climate change will kill these things regardless. Yeah. So there's a next question from Hernan Morales, please. I hope you can unmute yourself. Otherwise, Christian, can you? Hernan? Yeah, and I can see it. That's good. Yeah. So do you want me to say that? Yeah. So for those, I mean, people can see the chat, chat presumably, right? So, um, and I'm saying, are there any insights from your systems on the relative roles of adaptive and deleterious variation, e.g. variation underlying functional traits or the substrate of adaptive potential versus heterogeneity and masking deleterious variation? Look, that, that's a great question. They're often quite difficult to tease apart those things, right? Um, so in the mountain pygmy possum example, I think initially 
initially we were showing the masking effect of some deleterious genes, right? I suspect there was an element of that. But at the same time, the later expansions, now we've had these genotypes mixing for a few generations. I think now we're seeing more than that. Um, so I think by the time you get your F3s to the F5s, you're getting other benefits apart from just masking, right? So in, that, in the initial F1 generation, I agree with you. But I think later on, you're seeing other effects kicking in. But, you know, it's, it's certainly a situation where there is some initial masking that kicks in. And that's good, right? Because you want to do that. The challenge, and this is also why it's very important when you're doing these sorts of introductions to make sure that your population can expand. You know, you don't want your population staying very small. You want to be improving your habitat at the same time as your genetic introductions in these threatened species. Because what you don't want to do is have even more deleterious genes being introduced into a population that can then go to fixation, right? And there are some models about how that process can work. So as you introduce this, you want to try and have an expanding population of it all possible. That's the most powerful um, setup you can have. And we certainly had that in that situation because some of those bowler fields were being recreated at the same time. So it's a good question. I think both are important, but I think in later generations, we're seeing the other effects. Now, in the Drosophila example, it's pure evolutionary response, right? There's no masking, right? Those laboratory experiments I was showing you in the crustacean experiment is all about beyond masking. That's adapting to a new environment. And that's why they're so convincing, those examples. So, yeah. so actually the same question had been raised by Vincenzo Ostra, but he retracted his raised hand. <laughs> yeah. But apparently the question was uh, of relevance for more than just one Look. person here. So John Brill yeah. has uh, another question. If you are not able to unmute yourself, I can try from here. I don't know why it's happening because I actually set the setting. I've done it now. I think I've okay. done it now. That everybody can unmute, but I don't know why, why it doesn't work. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, so I guess I'm really interested in the tree examples because obviously a big contrast with trees is some are wind pollinated and some are insect pollinated or bird pollinated. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Presumably, you'd see a lot more evidence for local selective sweeps, or I wonder if you would in wind pollinated trees. Like I'm thinking of yeah. Antoine Cremer's work and with the oaks, where you see those lovely climbs in multi locus. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, and that's you know that's some of the nice examples, of course. Now it's interesting. I mean, the microcarpa, of course, is not wind pollinated; it's insect pollinated, and we are seeing excellent climbs. So, you, so clearly, with insect pollination, you can't get excellent climbs. I mean, it may just, I mean, presumably it would take long to establish, John, right? You know, I mean, that would be the prediction, right? Um, yeah. But yeah, there, there are plenty of examples of insect pollinated trees showing good climbs. So I think, I think it could take longer to develop, but it certainly does develop. And um, I mean, I guess, because yeah. I'm thinking as well of the period of dormancy, because with oaks, you, you basically, you've got so many genotypes in the soil. And yes. yes. Recruitment, you can just choose the right genotype in the right place. Yeah. I guess. And there's lots yeah. of genetic variants maybe a bit of load as well. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so again, I mean, that's, a, again, an interesting contrast, of course, because a lot of the eucalypts, I mean, you need a fire to come along, a hot fire to actually get germination. So. Yeah. So what you're, what you're typically doing is you're getting, you know, you're clearing effectively and then you're getting a dump, right? Yeah. And then you're clearing against. So so you're going through the cycle clearing process, which I think is quite different to what you're talking about with respect to the pollination. So, so awfully, at the awfully, same, awfully, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, awfully once has talked about, probably we'll talk about this, I guess, but the, the problem of low levels of recruitment in terms of you, you hard to, it's hard to see genetic variants in early life history because you don't have those fires sweeping through in a lot of temperate forests. So yeah, you don't get yeah, the opportunity totally. for lots of selection. Yeah. yeah, totally, totally. And of course, you know, the, the, I mean, the most interesting contrast to respect to that, of course, is when you go to the, 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 the tropical forests where a lot of the recruitment only happens when you get your cyclones coming through, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's totally intact. Then you get a bit of clearing, and that's when you're getting recruitment. So you're getting these flashes. And in that particular case, then presumably the, the you know the potential for selection is really limited, right? So, um, except for those very, very rare occasions. So I think, yeah, I mean, those are interesting questions about the steepness of the decline and the nature of the pollination. And I don't think I've seen a meta-analysis on that. So. You're good to do that. I think, 
Yeah, I, I think we've got examples, but we don't have the meta-analysis yet to say that. But I think the tropics should be included in that because of the extreme events. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's, yeah, no worries, John. Yeah. So there's another question in the chat from Devrim Kuling, but you might want to pose this directly if Christian can unmute you. <laughs> yeah, or I can read it out. Devrim, that's <clears throat> fine. So how did you measure aridity? Was it soil aridity in the or what you have measured water holding capacity or something else. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so at the moment, at the moment, the aridity measurements that we have that we use in that particular study were a bit crude. So, you know, I'll be the first person to admit that. Never. Um, so, you know, so we we basically were using a soil aridity index, but we now we now have better ones, of course, because what we have is we have a much better picture of the detailed microclimate and the soil that we can put into this. And, um, you know, through these new microclimate models, you can actually predict the soil moisture pretty accurately within, you know, 20 or 30 meters. Right? <laughs> um, you know, we've, it's kind of interesting. We've, you know, this is a bit of an aside, but we've just been doing some work on a couple of soil invertebrates. And we took all the soil measurements along the lines you suggested. And we got, you know, correlations of greater than 0.9 compared to the modeled ones versus what we were seeing. And the reason is because we have a much better soil map now across Australia than we used to have right, at a very fine scale. So, yeah, the aridity index, so the soil moisture index could be done a lot better now than what it was in that study. But, you know, I mean, regardless, I think your correlations would still be quite high. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, but you, you do need to consider the nature of the soil itself and the nature of the soil, particularly in our part of the world, can be very, very patchy. But it has been mapped reasonably accurately at the moment. So, yeah. Yeah, it's very difficult to, uh, I suppose, predict uh, across the whole, uh, let's say, one site uh, where, uh, you know, the, the, not the whole landscape is, of course, homogeneous. It's not homogeneous. Yes. So it's, it's, no, it's not. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's challenging. So I don't know how yeah. those aridity indexes are, they really make sense or not. Well, they, they make sense at a broad geographic level, right? Yes, yes, yes. But uh, and so I think at that stage, it's okay. At the Nadu Hill site, you know, we obviously had a lot of mortality at some sites, not so much mortality at others, and that's when the microclimate becomes important. But we do have two soil types there. We do have two soil types there, and of course, we have aspect as well that affects the amount of moisture we're getting in the soil, and we have mapped that now. Yeah. So I'm saying, yeah. So I mean, I think we can take it to that next level, but we haven't yet. What I'm hoping, of course, is that once we do that, we will start picking up a stronger signature of the provenances and the survival and the provenance effects on the survival, right? That's sort of the next step, yeah. yeah. So I think, it's, I think it's, yeah, I think it's a great point. I think we're getting better at it. Um, but I, and I think once we get better at it, we'll pick up more signature, right? That's, that's the yeah. advantage. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank yeah. you. No worries, yeah. Christian, is he allowed to raise his hand? At least he can unmute himself. Yes, Christian, you have a question. Thanks, Hori, for the talk. I have a very simple question. You said we should prioritize keystone species at the beginning of your talk, rather. Yep. So how do we identify keystone species? How do we know which ones are they? Well, you know, in, in the case of, I mean, you know, again, I'm talking about it from a local perspective. But, you know, in, in the case of, of the eucalypt forest, of course, we have these key eucalypts in the landscape, and we also have some key understory species that we know support birds, that we know support lizards, that we know support bats, that we know support small mammals, right? Um, so I think, you know, I think it's very important to keep those in the landscape because you know that at least you're supporting that. But so, so typically, when we talk, when I talk to Bush Heritage Australia, they say, "Look, you know, I want to get microcarpa back. I want to get a couple of banksias back. You know, I want to get a couple of wattle species back, and I want to get, you know, three or four other understory species back, as well as the yellow box. And then I'd be happy, right? So that that would be their list. I'm not just talking about a single species. I'm talking about a number of species. But they're also saying, well, if the yellow box dies, and of course, if the microcarpa dies." then you're going to lose your understory, right? You're not going to reestablish your understory unless you have those. So to them, the eucalypts take the front line, but you've got your other, you know, your sub line as well as being important in terms of supporting that. So, 
that's how they define it. Now, a keystone species, of course, can also be an animal, right? So the classic example we have in Australia is the cassowary. <laughs> and of course, the cassowary is critical in terms of spreading rainforest fruit seed. So if you don't have cassowaries, you're not getting your seed dispersal happening. Um, so, so it does depend on the situation you're looking at. But I, th I think certainly in terms of our Southeast Australian systems, we can identify the key eucalypts and the key understories that we know support a lot of other life because that sort of effects have been looked at. Yeah. But they can also be animals <laughs> to complicate things. Yeah. The trouble, you know, the, the problem always is that um, you, you have a limited budget. You can only go so far, right? And you have a limited ability to do revegetation. They can only go so far. I mean, when you've got 50 species in the landscape, I can't take nurseries and recreate 50 species. But what I can do is I can reestablish the canopy and the subcanopy and then spread other species around through seed potentially. So. But I guess we're tending to define key cells and species on the basis of what we see and what we can grasp. Well, so, so animals, small animals are likely not top of the list. Well, that's not true, actually, because one of the one of the keys, to, yeah. So one of the keystone species we have had in the past to this environment is actually as eastern bad bandicoots, because what those eastern bad bandicoots do is they dig up the soil and they chase they chase insects that are living in the soil, and of course they aerate the soil massively, right? So mm -hmm. that that was a very very important species in that particular environment. And once we lost that species, then we actually lost a lot of our aeration processes that supported grasslands and subcanopy species. I mean, you know, the, the, other, the other argument is that, oh, everything's a keystone species, right? <laughs> um, but at the same time, what you have to do is say, well, if you've got a common species and you know it supports other species, then that's probably a good one to prioritize. And the important thing is you can then also sell it to your non-government agencies. You can say, look, you know, it's worth starting your exercise in terms of focusing on this. And that's how we were able to sell that whole yellow box, gray box focus to, to the, um, the Bush Heritage Organization. Yeah. So there's another question from Santi Gonzalez Martinez. Uh, Christian is trying to unmute, I read. Is it working? Otherwise, Ari, you might read <laughs> I can read it. Yeah. I'm sorry. To help a little bit. If every it worked with. <laughs> Okay, so you've got a question in the eucalypt case study. Did you consider to plant also crosses between the different provenances? I'm concerned about long generation harvest species, but not be able to produce natural hybrids, either mixtures are planted, but rather local provenance may die before. Yeah, so the answer is we've set this up to eventually get to that, but we haven't at this stage. Right. <laughs> so, of course, you know, yeah, I mean, once they start maturing, then of course they are going to flower and cross pollinate and then we have to get seedlings from that generation. But at this stage, we haven't done that um, because we didn't have mixtures available. If we had a mixture available, then it would have been fantastic to plant it. It's, it's an interesting question because of course, what we would like to do in the future is to have um, you know, what, what people have talked about, mis mixed planting nurseries, right? So if you're trying to revegetate into an area where climate change has reached destruction or is about to, what you could do is go to these nurseries where you've got exactly what you're talking about, mixtures of genotypes hybridizing with one another and therefore producing a wonderfully genetic diverse stock that you could take seed from and use that in your plantings, you know, that would be an excellent exercise. So we have talked about that. We have tried to convince government to set up these sorts of nurseries, but, you know, we haven't had a lot of success at this stage. So the Nadu Hills example, eventually will provide that because we've got these different provenances, they'll mix, but I agree with these long living species, it's gonna take a while, um, but, you know, at the same time, hopefully in 15 years time, we'll start getting some interesting mixing happening. But I wish we could set that up now for the future that's the point you know we're going to take some risks now we don't take the risks we're not going to get anywhere at the risk of uh, breaking loose a uh, fundamental discussion uh, i would like to get back to the example in drosophila where you showed that uh, genetic diversity 
uh, nicely related to uh, adaptive response in these uh, 128 populations. Yeah. Um, I wonder what did you measure as genetic diversity and what is a reasonable measure for describing genetic diversity? We just had a big discussion yeah. lately uh, in relation to genetic monitoring of uh, or monitoring of genetic diversity, which indicators should we use, which is informative in terms of conservation. And I wondered here, what is genetic diversity? <laughs> yeah, so we we um we measure genetic diversity and it's it's an important question, right? We, so we measure at the moment just using SNPs. We use a few thousand SNPs scattered throughout the genome. And we don't care if they're adaptive or non-adaptive, we use it as a measure of genetic diversity, right? So Pretty simple, pretty straightforward in that particular case. Um, you know, I figured how many we had, probably 15,000 or so, and that's what we used in that particular case. The, the important question, it's, it's a very important question, particularly from a conservation perspective, but from any perspective is, is how do you then come up with your measure of genetic diversity? <laughs> and, and that is not straightforward, right? That is not straightforward. And to be honest with you, to be honest with you, um, we've actually been doing it a little bit wrong in conservation. Um, and that is a challenge that we have to face. And, you know, if you want to, I'll see if I can find this thing. Just, yeah, here we go. So at the moment, we have been thinking about that quite deeply. And we realized that in the past, we've actually made some mistakes, Felix. Um, and so what we've done is we've just Put this thing out. And we've basically said the human people got it right and the conservation people got it wrong. So what you need to do is you need to consider monomorphic and polymorphic loci and never distinguish between them. And if you do that, then you get an unbiased population as with a Gosti estimate. As soon as you start picking only polymorphic loci, you're going to get biases kicking in. So. Anyway, that's my answer. <laughs> so you you can measure it accurately. There's that paper in bioarchives that we've just put out, and um, it gives you a very good answer that is pretty accurate. And that example I gave you of the mountain pygmy possum, where you showed that beautiful increase right, in genetic diversity, unbiased, really reflective what was going on, and gave you a very good estimate. But that was again all scored on a few thousand SNPs. So you know if you sequence one percent of the genome, you get a bunch of SNPs. Measure your monomorphic as well as your polymorphic loci. That's the important thing. Monomorphic as well as polymorphic. Exactly. Then you'll get a good answer. Then you'll get a good answer. Yeah. But don't dump all your monomorphics because then you're going to get a biased estimate. Mm -hmm. So now questions are popping up. See, I initiated that. <laughs> uh, John Brill has another question. If it can be unmuted. Otherwise, Ari, can you read it? That was a comment. <laughs> I, I wasn't able to read. I had to listen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so John is saying there will also be an yeah. effect on long lives. I read that, John, and I said, hey, that's a comment from John. Yeah, You're thinking <laughs> temp temporal lags. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, I mean, I, 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 I don't know a cost. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I was, okay. I was actually just a follow-on comment. I didn't mean to, in, to take up more time by asking another question. So. Okay, that's fine. So we can move on to, to Fred, Fred Guillaume, who has a question also. <clears throat> but Fred has no audio. He has no audio. Okay. So, so this is the question. So Frederick, is that the one? Yeah. Yep. How do you envisage, and yeah, I've got one from Arno as well, I think. Yeah, that was a comment too, wasn't it? Graph flowering branches. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe, maybe I don't. I don't, I don't know if that's. You can sit. Eucalypts are notoriously difficult to grass, graft. Unfortunately, very, very difficult. Um, how do you envisage the utility of SNP frequency variation across space in a forecasting context? Ooh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> how can the data inform on future fitness effects without phenotyping measurements? That's a really good question. Um, and it's a tricky one. Um, and, you know, I think the answer is that maybe it can and maybe it can't. And let's not get too excited about it. Um, so 
we again i'm not i'm not trying to push i don't like pushing my own stuff but um we have just been involved in this discussion here and um and if you can see that or not yeah and that you know we we pretty much talk about that so that's our contribution to this debate and um there is another paper which is also contributing to this debate and um and basically you know the problem the problem i think is that it could work but you've got the situation where unexpected events are going to occur right so i think if you're confident that i mean you know phenotypic is a pain in the butt the trees is awful we're, you know, we're dealing with forestry plots to get some of our best data and they weren't set up to investigate climate change effects so they're often missing the provenance that you want to look at, even though they're interesting. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really a situation where I think you can do it, but you have to be confident about your stresses. And a lot of the time, as indicated in that eucalypt example, that snow gum example I was showing you, you don't know. Right? It's going to come out of the blue. The stress are going to come out of the blue. The ones that survive that beetle attack, the ones that have the genotypes that are resistant to the beetle, in that case, are going to be dealing with climate change. Right? <laughs> but unless you happen to be scoring SNPs that are linked to beetle attacks, you know, resistance in wood and what have you, you're going to miss it. That's the problem. A lot of climate change effects are going to be unpredictable. They're going to be based on traction between things, and that's going to be the problem. And of course, in, in other cases, you know, you may have wonderful associations between traits and SNPs, but the heritability of the trait might still be quite low. And if the heritability is low, then you're still going to be in trouble, right? So, so you need to have some heritable variations. So I, think, I, think it's, I think it's a great first start, but I think it's only going to give you so far because of those two factors. And I, I think you just need to make that next jump, and, then, and that next jump means that you have to do some monitoring. But I like the idea of setting up these experiments based on that sort of information and then doing future monitoring and learning as you're going, right? So, I, you know, I love the idea of doing translocation, setting up plots and using that as your experimental surface later, even if you set up your plots based on those original genomic efforts. Sorry for that long answer. But it's, it's, a, it's one that requires a, a debate and it'd be great ones to have. So we're progressing uh, in time, but there's still another question. Now, Vincenzo Ustra has come back with a question. Uh, can you directly ask? Uh, yes. Uh, so going back to genomic diversity, even if measured um, in an unbiased way. So I wondered, based on your Drosophila experiments, the, the lab experiments, can you say something about the predictive value of like genome-wide diversity? compared to diversity in specific, um, you know, functional or genes that are directly related to a trait of, you know, particular yeah, 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 ecological yeah, function. Yeah. So, yeah, which, so which loci are yeah. better predictors? Yeah. All right. Let me give you, I'll give you, a, I'll give you an indirect answer to that, right? So, so we, did, we did a selection experiment once on, on desiccation resistance in Drosophila. And um, so that's an aridity stress, right? And we, we, set up, we set up a number of replica lines. I forget how many it was. I think it was five replica lines. And we then did the genomics after we had an excellent selection response. All the lines increased in resistance at the same level. Okay? And it went up like that. And we didn't. We started from the same base population, sort of replica populations, and they watched them respond, right? And we then said, what's the genomic basis as detected by SNPs of that response to selection? And the answer was, it was polygenic. And it was different in most of the replica lines. So, so the problem, you know, so the problem is that the predictability of these complex trait responses may be quite low. That's what I'm saying. So, so I think I think if you if you're confident of your selective, your, your, you know, your locus under the selection, then I think great, go for it, right? And some of the phenological traits, some of the timing traits, like flowering time, you know, we have a reasonable understanding mechanistically of the genes involved and the processes involved right we can say there are three or four main genes and we have you know we can generate snips in those genes and we can actually look at those quite carefully and the original you know the original very nice work that was done in this area 
you know, actually used candidate genes where they had a very clear understanding that these genes were repeatedly involved in responses. In terms of most responses to climate change and not very logical, I think it's going to be polygenic. I think it's going to be all over the place. And I think there's going to be a low repeatability. So I think it's worth looking for candidates. And if you get lucky, I think it's terrific, right? Disease, phenology, probably going to work. But I think beyond that, it's going to be a tough ask because there are too many options. Evolution has options. So therefore, I say go for snips and scatter them everywhere. Right? So that would be my thinking unless you've got very clear candidates and it's um yeah it's an interesting question isn't it so i i always i like i quite like the human analogy with disease right so some diseases you've got specific genes that are involved other diseases you have liabilities and those liabilities can be due to a lot of different genes right mm -hmm. you know susceptibility to certain types of cancers are associated with a lot of different genes right there's an unpredictability depending on the family group you're talking about Right. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Then I think uh, with this, we can come to an end of this uh, session. Uh, and I would like to hand back to Christian for final announcements. And thank you, John, for indicating that you're commenting and not <laughs> asking. <laughs> thank you very much, Felix. Um, I just wanted to say two things. Next week, I don't know if you can see it, uh, we will have the talk of Ophélie Rance. This the next week, it will be in the afternoon at the normal time as we used to do the talks because it's in Europe. This time was a bit special because Ari comes from Melbourne. And I also wanted to announce that we have added the fourth seminar. It's Stephen Polumbi. And uh, you can register on the Apple Tree site for all these events. But hopefully there's still some space, uh, some places left. We have about 130 registrations also. So you have to hurry up a little bit if you want to still have a seat. Okay, then I thank you all for uh, your attendance. It was really cool. And I'm sorry about this little unmute problem. I hope to solve it until next week. And uh, hopefully see you next week at the uh, talk of Offerance. And many thanks to Ari for staying up. I don't know how late, but it was cool having you in the series and great talk from your side. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks very much for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. Okay, goodbye to everyone. See you next week. <laughs>